everyone, and welcome to The Propcast. My name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of LMR Ray and board director of the UKPA, and I shall be your weekly host. Each week for 30 minutes, we'll be connecting the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals globally, and assist in bridging that famous communication gap we all love talking about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the PropCast. Uh, today, we will be talking about transparency in commercial real estate data. And our guest today is Michael Mandel, co-founder and chief executive officer of CompStack. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks for having me. Um, now, those who are listening, CompStack is a US-founded real estate data and analytics company leveraging crowdsource commercial lease and sale transaction data and property information combined with AI-driven analytics. CompStack's 30,000 members provide data covering the entire US and its paying customers include the world's largest real estate investors and lenders, which I'm sure you know some of these names. It's JP Morgan, Blackstone, Brookfield, and many more. Additionally, CompStack has grown a strong data partnership business through data license and API integrations with firms like Moody's, RealPage, and uh, look, the list can go on. You should check out the website after after the show. Um, Now, since launching CompStack in early 2012, Michael has helped navigate the company through tremendous growth with over $30 um, million raised, hundreds of markets launched, and God, your team must be well over sort of 100 people now, Michael. And officers in, you know, the big cities, you know, New York, L.A., Chicago, Atlanta, um, the list goes on. Um, now, Michael has also been named 30 under 30 by Real Estate New York and the Rising Star by The Real Deal. Um, I'm sure some of you have also heard Michael uh, speak um, on the future of commercial real estate, uh, real estate technology and data transparency before um, and his speaking engagements include talks from, you know, the ULI, uh, Wharton School, Columbia University. Um, and Michael is also a star and has appeared on Fox Business, you know, National <laughs> Public Radio and featured on <laughs> Wall Street Journal, Forbes and various other notable publications. But um, look, um, hopefully this gives the audience a good flavor of your um, background, Michael. Now, let's uh, rather than me talking, let's hear a little bit more about you to um, your journey to founding CompStack. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Happy to do it. Um, and th- thanks for the very nice introduction. It makes, makes me feel like I'm a very big star, um, but um, very nice <laughs> to be here. Um, so, yeah, by way of background, um, before starting Comstack, I was a commercial real estate broker or, you know, in the, the UK, I guess I'd be an, an agent. And um, mm. I, I worked for Grubb & Ellis, which is now part of Newmark. And I did office leasing transactions uh, in New York City, and I also did data center transactions uh, throughout the country. And you know, the idea for Comstack came out of my experience as a broker, in that I was trading data with other brokers all the time, in particular uh, commercial lease comps, so detailed records of commercial lease transactions. And I was trading this information with other brokers um, over the phone via email and in our weekly Monday morning meeting where we'd all sit around a big boardroom table and talk about all the deals taking place in the market. And it occurred to me when I was in one of these meetings that it just, the the whole process was, was a waste of time (laughs) because I would be frantically calling up, you know, other brokers (laughs) that I know um, on Sunday night, you know, at, at, at CBRE or JLL or Cushman or whatever the case may be. So I could bring comps to the table, you know, on my Monday morning meeting but mostly, you know, people were talking about hedge fund deals and law firm deals and bank deals. And I was mostly representing tech companies in, in different neighborhoods where, you know, it wasn't relevant. But at the same time, you know, when I am working on a deal, I would want to know about the relevant deals at that time. And so the idea behind Comstack was simply to move that, that trading of information from offline to online so that our, our members who are brokers, appraisers, and research people within real estate brokerage firms could share um, information on Comstack, earn credits for sharing that data, which is like a virtual currency, 
and use those credits to get other data back out. And that way you can actually get the specific comps you need when you need them and when they're relevant for the deals that you're working on. So that was the original, the original concept oh. and we continued to grow, grow from there. Um, that was what I, I had a big question about, you know, how do you almost like monetize your product? You know, if everyone's, you know, what and how do people sort of um, get stuff back? Obviously, all your customers will get all the data, but you as a, you know, owner uh, with the sort of freemium content, how would you personally sort of monetize it? But that makes a lot of sense in terms of tokens. Well, you know, the tokens are uh, actually there's no monetary value to, to, the, to the tokens or to the credits on the exchange side of our platform. So actually you can't buy credits. You can only earn credits by submitting data. Um, the way that we make money is by selling subscription access to the data. So um, we've effectively have two sides to our uh, platform. So there's Comstack Exchange where the brokers, appraisers, researchers share comps and, and get comps out. And then we have um, Comstack Enterprise where we sell subscription access to that data to you know, banks, private equity funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, pension funds, insurance companies, institutional real estate owners, you know, flexible office space companies, mm -hmm. you name it. Um, and so they pay for access to our data. And, and the data we're selling them, it's, it's lease comp data, sales comp data, property data. And then we have an analytics suite that sits on top of all of those data sets and lets you get more insights, you know, from it. So uh, anyone can sort of uh, obviously go on and sort of put this data in. And so that's, I guess, how you create complete transparency um, in, in data. Uh, to some extent, it's not anyone. So only, you know, people who are um, commercial real estate brokers or, you know, or agents, um, appraisers, um, you valuers <laughs> and and researchers um, within real estate brokerage firms. Anyone else would have to pay for access to the data. Okay, cool. So th there's a good sort of vetting process behind it as well. Yeah, and is, um, yeah. I guess since you sort of grew in, <laughs> and since you grew in 2012, um, I guess how how has this whole data platform changed? It must, you know, is your obviously as your brand sort of grows as well, you must you must be storing so much data. You know, you said how it sort of varies from obviously brokers to, you know, hedge funds who are using this. Like how big is the data platform now? There's several million comps in the platform. Um, there's a couple million properties. Um, there's something like, I think, was it 25 billion square feet worth of transaction data, give or take, something like that. So there's, wow. there's, a, there's a lot of data. Um, it's growing, it's growing exponentially. I think last quarter we brought in about 250,000 comps and, um, you know, that includes recent <laughs> deals and, and a, a lot of historic deals. Um, and the crazy thing too, is that the data that we bring in from our members, I mean, this is, this is information coming in in word documents, Excel spreadsheets in the body of an email. We get PDFs, we get scanned PDFs. We have people send us pictures of post-it notes. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> so we're bringing in really, really like kind of dirty unstructured data. We have to make sense of it, dedupe it, get it into mm. the system and get it live on the platform. So bloody hell, that's a, that's a, that's a big old task. So who's, who's doing this? Are these like data scientists who are sort of looking at, you know, analyzing these data? How are you converting it? So it's a combination of things, right? So when we first started, it was just a team of, you know, people in, in well, originally it was me, but, <laughs> but you know, after that, it was a team of people um, in, our, in our New York office who were manually reviewing every comp. You know, then that team grew. Um, and we, um, from there, you know, found that, you know, we we're just bringing in too much data. We couldn't do it all manually. So then we built, a, you know, a heavy amount of machine learning and, and AI on top of the process and other kind of um, kind of technology methodologies around around normalizing and cleaning up the data where we could automate a lot of what the analysts were doing. We could learn from the decisions that they were making, find, you know, patterns in, in those decisions and make those decisions in an automated fashion. And so now something like 80, 90% of the data that comes through gets processed, you know, in an automated fashion. And then the remainder um, gets reviewed manually by our analysts. I should say there's still a good amount of work kind of setting up the data, 
you know, for it to even get into the system, whether it's manual cleanup or some of it's, you know, using, you know, um, optical character recognition and, um, you know, um, you know, even deep learning, we're looking at like the, the logos and files and using the logos that we do on a file to indicate the quality of the file based off of what, where it may have come from, like the firm that, you know, brokerage firm that submitted it or things like that. Um, but, um, you know, mm. natural language processing and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but we also now, um, we've built a kind of a, a process um, and we've actually built our own team. We just recently, um, incorporated and set up an office in Belgrade, Serbia. And we have a team of people in Serbia um, that work with us who manually, re, you know, review data as well and work in conjunction with our team, our, our team in New York. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so sort of truly growing a uh, global almost. Um, now, Michael, uh, one of our earlier guests, I think it was on, God, I think it was season two um, of, of this podcast was with um, the well-known founder, LD or Cherry, who I see uh, CompStack has partnered with. At first, I thought, and maybe naively, I would see that as sort of competition. Can you tell us a little bit more about partnership and how you guys, uh, your um, businesses complement each other? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, you know, what, what's, what's somewhat unique about CompStack, particularly in the kind of the latest sort of iteration of the of, of prop tech and, and real estate data is that we have a quite a unique proprietary data set. And so a lot of the other data companies out there are focused on how they analyze data, re, you know, bring different data sources together, make sense out of that data. And we do some of that in, in, in house as well, right? Um, but um, we're really, you know, we're we actually complementary to a lot of those companies because um, we're one of those data sources that they would want to pull in for their clients to allow them to make better sense of their internal data alongside market data. And so in the case of Cherry, you know, that's, that's where the opportunity lies that, you know, maybe they'll bring in data from one of their clients. They'll bring in some other um, external data sources. Maybe it's economic data, employment data, um, credit card data, whatever the case may be and leverage our transactional data for leases and sales alongside that. And so, uh, effectively, the way it works is if if one of their clients is a Comstack client and has, um, you know, basically signed an agreement with us to have access to our data, that will allow those those clients to leverage that data within the Cherry platform. And you know, more broadly, as we as we think about partnerships, um, because of kind of the uniqueness of our data set, we've been able to structure similar deals with a lot of different firms to. You know, the most notable recent one was a deal we signed with um, with TREP. And TREP is, is the leader in commercial mortgage-backed security data and, and loan data. And, and so um, we've been able to pull in some of our aggregated data into the TREP platform um, for all of their users. And then mm -hmm. for TREP users who have Comstack accounts, they can see our very granular leasing data within TREP. And that's really helpful, right, when they're looking at you know, the um, CMBS and um, the properties that go into a, um, a package, you know, of loans, um, they can actually see the underlying data within those properties to better understand the risk of those of those loans um, and those, those secure, the securities effectively, right? So we can, you know, I think we end up being complementary to a lot of companies yeah. out there. And we're actually about to announce a very big, um, partnership where we're bringing in uh, a new asset class into CompStack, where we're bringing in a partner's data into our platform, which we're very excited about. I'm not ready to announce it ah, yet. But, uh, well, I'm looking but... forward to that, Michael. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, very exciting. Uh, well, we'll have to wait to see, mate. What, we sort of thinking, Law, is that coming out in 2020 or 2021? Um, well, we may announce it in 2020. It probably won't be live on our platform until 2021, yeah. though. Awesome. Look, um, exciting times ahead. Position yourself to thrive with a five-week course that covers the essentials of designing, developing, marketing, and operating offices in 2021 and beyond. Check out the Future Proof Office course at realinnovationacademy.com. Quote LMRE for a 10% discount. Now, for some of our listeners, obviously they completely vary in terms of 
what they do from startups to the real estate guys to finance. Now, for uh, some of the founders maybe listening in who are sort of obviously an early stage to what uh, you are, um, where is there any advice you'd say or the, you know, when would you say the right uh, time is to start looking at uh, the partnership model? Um, not too early, <laughs> you know, honestly, honestly. Um, you know, we it took it was years before we started entertaining, you know, partnership opportunities. You know, the reality is that you need to just you need to be focused on your core business, you know, um, early on. Now, now some businesses um, as core to their to their business, they rely on partnerships for that business to succeed. But that's tricky, right? I mean, it, if you're like a proven, successful, you know, kind of serial entrepreneur that's built a reputation then maybe you can pull that off and, and get into, you know, bringing partnerships into your business day one. But if you're not, and you don't have a lot of credibility, you know, the, the big companies that are probably the most, most valuable for you to partner with are just not mm-hmm. going to want to waste their time with you. <laughs> and so, you know, and from your standpoint too, as you know, when partnering with other companies, it can, it can create a lot of distraction yeah. um, from, from focusing on your core, your core stuff. So I would say for most people, probably better to wait. Um, and, and do it when it really makes more sense. You know, it's, it's tricky for us because we have startups approach us every day who want to use our data, partner with us in some way. And even today, you know, we have to, we, we have kind of robust APIs that make it a little easier to do these deals, but at the same time, they are still just, you know, they can still be distractions. We have other things we got to worry about and other work we have to do. So you have to really be thoughtful about it. If you jump into all of them, you, you'll end up, you know, burning too many cycles on these things yeah i can definitely um i definitely echo that i think our business at mre our day-to-day job is recruitment and helping businesses startups you know scale and hire but outside of it i'm permanently looking at different partnerships we do with you know associations like we've got one with the prop tech collective and we've got other sort of you know all the podcasts but it can so easy to get distracted. And then before I know it, I spend, you know, three hours talking to people on a podcast, you know, you know, two hours drawing up an association like um, agreement. And then my founder, Brad's just like, Lou, like you do realize we run a recruitment business. You just spent two out of five days this week <laughs> um, <laughs> not doing the job. Uh, but it's definitely, I think, yeah, timing is uh, comes into it and managing your time as well. Um Okay, so I guess let's go on to, um, I guess, a big big topic. You know, we're saying this this uh, podcast is on the transparency of data. When did you see data start becoming super important? You know, cash is king. You know, that's what everyone always says. But data really is king and cleaning it up. Where, when did you start seeing more of the movement? You know, honestly, in my mind, like, data has always been critical. You know, the, the whole the, the whole basis for Comstack was around the fact that, you know, before prop tech was even a term, um, the, you know, we were, I was using data every day and doing transactions on a day-to-day basis. I think that um, a lot more of the maybe, you know, excitement, it was funny, actually, I was, I was on a panel just a, a, like a couple of weeks ago and somebody asked me, like, when did data move from the, the back office to the front or to the front office. And I said, no, the data was already in the front office. It's been moving to the back office. Like when I was a broker, I was a front office person, but I needed to use comp data every day of the day of the week to get deals done. I I think that um, it's actually now where we're seeing, you know, companies build out data science teams and robust Mm. research teams where they're trying to leverage bulk data in a lot of different ways and get insights from it. But like data and its kind of most granular basic form has been used in the industry forever. You know, maybe it was traded, you know, over the phone or in meetings or informally, but it was, it's always been very, very critical. Now, though, I think it's become table stakes, you know, like it, it used to be, I think that it was relationships first, data second. I think it's now data first, relationship second. Um, and um, you, you have to be on top of uh, your game and the market. And, and, and as there is more data, the, the, there being more data and there being transparency in data actually creates more need for data, right? Because 
as more people are using it and the market becomes more efficient, you need to have access to it to know where things stand. And so it becomes like a, a virtuous cycle where more data leads to more data leads to more data leads to more insight and then continues to, to make it more important in the industry. Does um does more data and more data ever mean more problems and in terms of us sort of keeping up and making sure it's clean, like all the data on your platform, surely a number one priority is make sure that it, it's good data on it and you're obviously filtering it through nonstop. What's um surely there's quite a few obstacles ahead of us in terms of data? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, data in the indus in the commercial real estate industry or or the, the property industry, as you guys call it. Um, <laughs> you know, um, is just very messy, completely inconsistent. Um, every market is different. And when I say every market, I don't mean every market by virtue of, you know, country. I mean, every market by, by virtue of, you know, a tiny, you know, local level, right? I mean, um, in San Francisco, rents are quoted per square foot per year, but, you know, you go right over the, the line from San Francisco into the greater Bay Area and rents are quoted per square foot per month. Um, you know, the, the terminology and the structure of data, the way people think about it varies dramatically um, across the industry. And so, yeah, having more data creates lots of problems and challenges to overcome. The other aspect of it too, is I think there's been a, an obsession um, in the industry in the last few years around alternative data sets. Mm. You know, how can I, you know, d determine the value of a property based off of, you know, its proximity to parks or the number of incidents of robberies nearby, or, you know, the credit card payments of X or, you know, there's like a million different data sets. And some of them are really interesting and some are not as interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think that there's been almost an over indexing on these alternative data sets um, because the reality is there are, there are data sets that are fundamental and then there are all data, the data sets. They're called alternative data sets because they really are alternative. They are not the fundamental data sets and you need yeah. to, you need to get the fundamentals right. And the, the, you know, before you start looking at those, that, that data on the kind of on the fringe, you know, and so we are mostly, you know, at Comstack, we're focused on, on fundamentals. You know, you know, like leasing data is absolutely core because it drives the income of the property and, you know, investment grade assets are valued on an income approach. And so understanding the income is absolutely critical. You know, sales transaction data, is what the property sold for, it is critical. Mm. We're, we're focused more on the, on those data sets than on the alternative data sets. Although I do find those interesting, but I think there has been a little bit of over indexing in those areas. Well, and also we've got another asset class, too, which is going to be added to your data set. So we look forward to that happening. And yeah. now we've nearly gone through a whole podcast without mentioning the COVID word. What's the, um, what's the biggest disruption you've seen um, COVID caused in the market then? You can obviously focus saying on the US market. Well, you know, there's a million different disruptions. I mean, on a personal level, I, I'm doing this podcast from home and I'd rather be doing it in the office. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I would say in the data that we track, obviously, you know, retail has been the most impacted. That's no surprise there. I mean, retail has been destroyed. <laughs> um, you know, um, certainly offices impacted, been impacted meaningfully. Even industrial, we've seen, you know, in, in a lot of markets, industrial rents have even gone down a bit, even though industrial has been viewed as being very strong um, in, in the market. So it's, it's, there's nowhere without impact, but um, it's also creating interesting opportunities for, for different firms. You know, we've seen an interest, an increase in interest from um, hedge funds in our data because they trade on instability in the markets and they're trying to, to capture value from, from, from this. So it's, it's a hard question to answer because yeah. it seems like just about everything has been disrupted by COVID. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. It's very sort of, it's very broad. Um, I was on a panel the other day and they said, what trends are you seeing in the prop tech space? And I was like, hmm, well, there's plenty of different verticals we can go into, but um, I'll just say date and sustainability to keep it like brave. <laughs> um, look, um, Michael, it is coming to the end of the podcast. Um, for our listeners uh, tuning in, 
um, how can they connect with you if they want to upload, if they're, you know, brokers or, you know, agents, hedge funds? Um, how do you, um, how do they uh, uh, connect with Comstack and with you? Well, they can, they can certainly email me. I'm, I'm Michael at Comstack.com and I'm uh, happy to, happy to, to respond and, and, uh, and chat. Um, I'm also on Twitter, Comstack CEO, and I'm, I don't know, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook and all those <laughs> other things as well. So they can, you know, whatever works is fine with me. <laughs> Michael's about guys. Um, look, Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you on the podcast, and I am looking forward to catching up with you after the show. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me. Thank you for joining us this week on the Propcast and a big thanks to our special guests. Make sure you visit our website, www.nmre.co.uk, where you can subscribe to our show or you'll find us on iTunes and Spotify, where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate it if you could rate and review us on iTunes or if you simply just spread the word. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday and I'll catch you later. Hi, this is Nelson from Property Quants. I'd like to invite you to join our Introduction to Data Science and Machine Learning for Real Estate seminar. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash seminar and use special code LMRE20 on Eventbrite for a discount. You're listening to a podcast company podcast. This was made by Podcast Syndicator, where we help you go from start to grow to making money with your podcast. Let us help you share your message and your voice with the world. Reach out now, Jason at podcastsyndicator.com or Brett at podcastsyndicator.com to find out more. Thank you for listening and do come back to hear nothing but the best podcasts.